My name is Elina, and I'm going to talk about my capstone project, which was based on utilizing um, Copernicus and Google Earth satellite imagery to define habitat suitability for flying squirrels, uh, spe specifically northern species in the Lower Rouge River Basin. Uh, so flying squirrels are a conservation concern. In Ontario, northern species are endangered of being extirpated from their southern limit in Rouge National Urban Park. Uh, this is the only known inhabited site in the city of Toronto. The southern species, on the other hand, have already been extirpated from the Toronto region. This is a concern because both uh, northern and southern flying squirrel species play a significant role in the ecosystem. They serve as forest health indicators, uh, they are prey to many forest dwellers, and they're great seed dispersers. There are two species of flying squirrels in North America, uh, the northern flying squirrel uh, seen on the left and the southern flying squirrel on the right. Although they look similar, they do have notable differences. Northern species like to inhabit north temperate uh, conifer and mixed forests, while the southern species inhabit deciduous and hardwood forests. So there are several causes to their population decline. Um, habitat loss uh, being the primary threat, urban expansion, fragmentation, and edge effects also contribute. Flying squirrels are able to glide within a forested area quite easily, however their walking abilities are not so good. So small populations are more vulnerable to local extinction when there are large open space, uh, spaces in the landscape. And these um, open spaces are more common in cities such as Toronto. So local forested conditions are critical for flying squirrels and it's important to understand their habitat conditions in order to maintain viable populations. One way to assess habitat conditions is through remote sensing techniques. Uh, remote sensing is efficient in collecting spatially explicit information of forest features. An example here is Solaris, uh, which is based on Landsat imagery. It provides a land cover map of southern Ontario. Um, a good thing about this platform is that it's open space. Uh, it's open source, so it is available to anyone. On the right is a close-up image of the Lower Rouge area. The different colors represent different land cover types. Solaris includes several forested land classes, um, including coniferous, deciduous, mixed forests, uh, thicket swamps, and wooded hedgerows, among others. It's important to know the distinction between the coniferous and deciduous forests because it can help map flying squirrel habitats. However, Solaris is based on low resolution imagery of 30 meters um, and its forest composition is very coarse. So it's worth seeing if the forest representation in Solaris can be improved and if a high resolution of forest maps can be obtained. Another source of data is Google Earth imagery. It's also open source. Um, it provides high resolution images of about 0.5 meters. Uh, the leaf off images can be used to map conifer cover. So if you look at the images uh, here, both, both the, they're both of the Southern uh, Rouge, uh, just above the 401 highway. On the left is an image from December 2005, and on the right is an image from April 2016. Uh, they both show conifer cover, which can help map um, which can uh, be used for uh, mapping. Although uh, Google Earth provides high resolution, it is, however, eclectic, so some regions show images from different dates. These are the actual images I used for my study, so I made sure that um, the area I focused on was of just, like the image is of 2005 and of 2016. Images from Copernicus satellite, such as the one displayed on the left, um, has the potential to significantly improve forest mapping. Its multispectral and temporally comprehensive imagery is useful in providing vegetative information. However, its images are of a lower, lower resolution, ranging from 10 to 60 meters. Uh, the image on the right is from a study conducted in the mixed wood forests of the Polish Carpathian Mountains. They used the time series images from Copernicus to successfully improve mapping of tree species in the forest. Uh, as you can see, they're able to ma map several species, including common beech, um, common hornbeam, uh, Norway spruce, among other species. With, the, with these different sources of data, I want to see if imagery from Google Earth and Copernicus satellite can improve the level of detail in Solaris. Uh, this was a first attempt for me, so unlike the Poland study, where they mapped at the species level, my goal was to map the conifer cover. So the objectives of my research was to first create a high-resolution map of conifer cover in the Rouge National Park uh, 
urban park, specifically the southern region. My second objective was to investigate habitat viability for northern flying squirrels through modeling. So jumping into my methods, on the left is an image of the entire Rouge National Park. It's a total of just over 79 kilometers square, making it the largest urban park in North America. So for the purpose of this study, I focus on the lower region indicated by the orange star. I used two Google Earth images, as I previously showed the uh, 2005 images on the top and the 2016 image is in the middle. A true color image from the Copernicus satellite was also used and this was from March of this year. These dates were specifically chosen because they displayed clear leaf off and cloud free images, which helped in identifying coniferous trees. So using tools uh, from ArcGIS, I masked both Google Earth images to remove most of the non-forest land cover surrounding my focus area. The first approach I used was supervised classification to identify conifer cover. Based on visual assessment, I created training polygons and validation polygons for each image separately. A total of 1,200 training polygons and 463 validation polygons were created for the 2006, uh, the 2005 image and a total of 2,214 training polygons and 866 validation polygons were created for the uh, 2016 image. I included five land cover classes, which were coniferous trees, rivers, roads, buildings, and open space. Uh, since it was based on leaf off conditions, open space represented deciduous cover. For the second approach, I first applied segmentation, which grouped adjacent pixels with similar spectral characteristics together. I then used the training polygons to classify the five land covers, and then again, I reclassified to conifer and non-conifer. For Copernicus, um, since the image uh, is coarse, the pixel resolution was first transformed from 10 meters to point at 20 meters in order to apply the training and validation polygons from the Google Earth images. I then uh, reclassified the Copernicus image to conifer and non-conifer as well. So this slide uh, just shows you a visual of what's been done. On the left is the 2005 Google Earth image with the training polygons I created. Uh, the white polygons indicate a conifer cover and the rest are non-conifer classes. On the right is a closer image of the area. You can see each polygon uh, was created to classify a specific land class. So three methods were used to validate the classifications. First, I calculated the overall classification of each validation polygon as either conifer or non-conifer. So if more than 50% of the underlying pixels of the polygon were of a conifer class, that polygon was classified as conifer. But if it was, if it was less than 50%, it was considered non-conifer. Second, I calculated the percentage of pixels in the polygon that were of different land classes. And finally, I used data from the vegetative sampling plots provided by Daniela Purick to assess the accuracy of the classifications. I extracted the classification results uh, for each of the 11.28 meter radius VSP plots. And then I plotted the percentages of pixels in the polygon that were conifer against the percentage of the VSP plots that were conifer. For my second objective, which was to model habitat viability for northern flying squirrels, I used a model created by my supervisor, Jane Malcolm, and a fellow colleague, Julian Alvarez Barkham, to compare my 2005 Copernicus uh, classification against Solaris. So their model was a metapopulation model based on Hansky's work, which showed that, meta that metapopulation is a dynamic interplay over time between extinctions from fragments and colonizations from neighboring fragments. The extinction probability uh, used was based on the carrying capacity of a fragment and the intrinsic rate of increasing population and its variance. The parameters used for this study were conservative, so the population in a given fragment was determined by the fragment area times the density parameter, which was 0.3 individuals per hectare, times the average habitat suitability index, which uh, represents the capacity of a given habitat to support flying squirrel species. The, col the colonization distances between neighboring fragments were based on the shortest path between the fragments over a cost surface. Uh, also, the fragments that were less than 0.1 hectares were just assumed to be unoccupied. So moving into the results, on the left is an image, same image as before with the training polygons on the 2005 Google Earth image. On the right is the result of reclassification of conifers, which is indicated by green, and non-conifers indicated by brown. 
On the left is uh, the 2005 image, but now using the second approach of segmentation. Um, on the, uh, yeah, so on the right is the image after reclassification. Again, green indicates coniferous trees and brown indicates non-conifer. Now these are the results of reclassification for the 2016 image. On the left shows the first approach of supervised classification. On the right shows you the results when segmentation was first applied. Again, green is conifer and brown is non-conifer. Finally, these are the results for the Copernicus image. The left, image is, the left image shows the results using uh, Google Earth 2005 training polygons, and the right shows you um, uh, reclassification based on the 2016 training polygons. You may notice that the 2016 image indicates a larger conifer cover. Um, I will go over uh, why that might be a bit later. So this is the result of the first method of validation, which was using uh, my validation polygons to assess the accuracy of the conifer maps. Uh, this table shows the proportion of validation polygons classified as conifer and non-conifer. In general, all images uh, showed pretty good results for the supervised classification. The 2005 image uh, was a better, uh, in, was more successful in classifying conifers with about 99% success compared to the 2016 image, which was about 90%. What's interesting though is that Copernicus did better in conifer classification based on the 2016 with 93% success compared to the 2005, which was 84%. Looking at the segmentation approach, the 2005 image did pretty well with 96% success, but the 2016 image was much lower with only 78%. This table shows the results using the second validation method, which was assessing the validation polygons on the pixel level instead of the polygon level. It reveals similar results. Uh, the 2005 image showed an overall higher success of conifer classifications, uh, ranging from 88 to 94%. Um, compared to the 2016 image, which was mostly 83%. Again, what's interesting is that the opposite was true when it came to the Copernicus image, which showed higher conifer classification using the 2016 validation polygons with uh, 94% or about 95% success uh, compared to the 2005 polygons, which was 88%. So this is the this shows the uh, percentage of underlying pixels of the validation polygons. Same concept as the last slide, um, but uh, now we're just looking at conifer and non-conifer. The 2005 image fared better in classifying conifers for both supervised and segmentation, with 92% and 94% uh, respectively, compared to the 2016 image, which was both 83%. Again, Copernicus showed higher success for 2016 training polygons, which was 95%, compared to 2005 polygons, which was 88%. Here are the results using the third uh, method of validation, uh, which was utilizing data from the VSP plots to assess the accuracy of conifer classification. The y-axis states the percentage of uh, pixels classified as conifer, while the x-axis states the percentage of conifer basal area from the VSP fixed plots. On the left, it shows you the 2005 Google Earth results based on supervised classification. Uh, this result was um, representative of what I found for the 2016 image as well, both for supervised and uh, segmentation. The result on the, the, the right side shows you the results for a Copernicus image based on 2005 polygons. Again, very similar plot uh, results using the 2016 data. So you can see that the correlation was relatively good for the Google Earth image on the left with a 57% R-square value, but Copernicus didn't do as well with only a 35% square value, R-square value, although significance was good for both of them. Um, here we're looking at the percentage of variance explained and the p-values for all the images that I used for the study. As you can see, uh, they were all significant. However, Google Earth images correlated with the VSP data better, uh, with 2005 doing uh, better than the 2016. Again, Copernicus did not correlate well. A possible explanation for this can be because uh, there just wasn't many VSP plots, um, but also the plots themselves were small. It was only about uh, 11 meter radius. Since the resolution of uh, the Copernicus was coarse, the conifer polygons in reference to the VSP plots could have easily been offset, which is why we see this poor correlation. However, Google Earth did better, probably because its image resolution is about uh, 0.50 uh, meters. 
So moving on to the results for my second objective, this is where we want to model habitat viability for northern flying squirrels. First, we did a comparison of Solus, which is on the left, and Copernicus, which is on the right, uh, based on the 2005 conifer classification. Both images are showing you the same region. Uh, the red line is uh, Highway 401, and uh, we're looking at the lower southern uh, Rouge area. Everything was held constant between these two maps, except for the forest representation. So we know that northern flying squirrels inhabit both conifer and mixed uh, wood forests. So looking at the Solaris map, the coniferous forest cover, indicated by the dark green, was given a habitat suitability index of one, since that is their preferred habitat type. While mixed forest, indicated by the light green, was given half that value of a 0.5. For the Copernicus map, coniferous forests is the only inhabited site for the flying squirrels, and like Solaris, it was given a habitat suitability index of one. Uh, for the dispersal capability costs, they were held constant for both Solaris and Copernicus. So other forests indicated by white was given a cost of 0.25. Undifferentiated areas in pink were given a cost of one, and built up was given a cost of two, which was the least optimal for the flying squirrels. These two maps are essentially the same, with the exception that they represent conifer forests differently, which may have important impl implications for northern flying squirrels. So here we're looking at the results from a simulation of the probability for flying squirrel populations. It's based on 100 runs for a period of 400 years. You can see that the different conifer cover estimates between Solaris and Copernicus show a difference in population dynamics. Although Solaris starts off with a larger population, um, it quickly declines and steadily continues to decline, whereas Copernicus attains a more stable population size earlier. It's less variable and the overall population does not decline, but rather it levels off. So uh, looking back at my first objective, uh, we saw that 2005 a Google Earth image was more successful in classifying conifers than the 2016. Uh, so when you look at the two images side by side, you can see there's a difference in spectral properties, which influences the clarity of conifer cover. And you can notice that the 2005 is noticeably better. Um, also, the varying shadows between the images could have played a role in the different results that we saw. For example, shadows from buildings um, could have looked like shadows from casted by trees, and therefore misclassification could have uh, led to overestimations of conifers, particularly in the 2016 image. Regarding Copernicus, it was interesting to see that better results were based on the 2016 data. So if you look uh, at the Copernicus image on the very right, you can see that there is some snow cover, uh, which may have influenced the results of conifer classification. What we do need is more ground data so that we'd be able to better understand what's really going on. Also, uh, very important to note, uh, this discrepancy could have been due to a minor mistake on my part when I was creating my polygons. Um, I had put a larger emphasis on classifying conifers, and I ended up creating far more polygons for the conifer class compared to other classes. Uh, and because I made about a thousand more polygons for the 2016 Google Earth image compared to 2005, that may have resulted why Copernicus classification was more successful based on the 2016 polygons. Um, this was a great learning experience for me before future equal amounts of polygons for each land cover class should be created. So looking at my second objective, we saw a slight difference in probability of northern flying squirrel populations between Solaris and Copernicus. Um, what might explain this is that Copernicus has small patches of conifer across the landscape. So uh, these finer grain distributions of conifer cover can provide stepping stones for dispersal, which might mean that small populations are being repopulated by the dispersal of flying squirrels from neighboring fragments. Although Copernicus cover, the Copernicus map cover um, suggests more viable populations of northern flying squirrels, it is important to note that this is all highly speculative. Uh, we can't conclude one is better than the other at this point. So to conclude, um, far more data is necessary, uh, sorry, field data is necessary for validation and accurate assessment of conifer uh, forest cover. Also equal training uh, samples for land cover classification is necessary for future mapping. 
With regards to the habitat suitability model, this was a more of a thought experiment. The parameters were poorly understood. However, a good thing about this model, uh, since it's based on Hansky's metapopulation model, with repeated field sampling of populations over time, uh, that would enable us to parameterize the model, therefore come up with a better assessment of habitat suitability. Um, with regards to the southern uh, species, uh, we need to establish their status first. Although it's been thought that they have been extirpated from the Toronto region, we really need field data to verify that. Uh, they may be, there may be small populations that have simply been misidentified as northern species, or since they are nocturnal and they are smaller than their northern counterparts, they may just be hard to observe. So studies looking at the, lo uh, to locate southern flying squirrels through trapping is necessary. Uh, with that, I conclude, and I just want to say thank you to Jay Malcolm for being my internal supervisor and to Leonardo Cabrera for being my external supervisor who couldn't make it here today. Um, and thank you to Daniela Pirik for providing me the DSP data and to Julian Alvarez Barkham for the work he did with Jay on the model that I used. Questions? So given the highly fragmented nature of the Lower Rouge, which provides a less than ideal habitat for both the southern and northern flying squirrel, and the relatively higher deciduous cover than coniferous cover in the area, could you speculate why you would expect to find the northern flying squirrel if there are viable populations over the southern flying squirrel? Um, well, uh, so the northern species uh, have a different diet than the southern species. Uh, the southern species rely on mast, which uh, varies from year to year. So, uh, so with, uh, with years where there isn't uh, much uh, mass for them to feed on, uh, their populations decline. Also, uh, they are more vulnerable to the cold. So if, even though there is, it does suggest that there's more deciduous cover, um, it is still very highly fragmented, so it's not suitable for the southern flying squirrels to, to be able to survive in such conditions. Other questions? Is the Rouge Park <coughs> interested in increasing its conifer cover for this reason? Um, I don't know what their, like what their management plans are, um, but I just focused on the southern region just because uh, we know that the northern flying squirrels have been uh, spotted there. That's been reported, but I, I don't know what their management plan is. I'm a bit familiar with the management plan of Rouge Park, and from my understanding, it, it doesn't recognize, unfortunately, the, the flying squirrels and the objective in the, you know, planning of the park. It, it, this certainly, I think, shows a omission that, you know, people should be concerned about. Is, is that... Uh, yeah, uh, it is something to be concerned about. Uh, again, like I, I don't know what their management plan is, but like with with work like this, hopefully, um, the concern is brought up to the forefront, and they'll use data such as this to probably incorporate, you know, conifer cover or even deciduous cover in in their mappings or in their uh, management plans. Okay. Uh, no last question. Okay. Thank you very much.